Chapter 7 Cutting from the Daily Graph, 8th of August, pasted in Mina Murray's journal. From a correspondence. One of the greatest and suddenest storms on record has just been experienced here, with results both strange and unique. The weather had been somewhat sultry, but not to any degree uncommon in the month of August. Saturday evening was as fine as was ever known, and the great body of holidaymakers set out yesterday for visits to Mulgrave Woods, Robin Hood's Bay, Rig Mill, Brunswick, Stasis, and the various trips of the neighborhood of Whitby. The steamers Emma and Scarborough made excursions along the coast, and there was an unusual amount of tripping both to and from Whitby. The day was unusually fine till the afternoon, when some of the gossips who frequent the East Cliff Courtyard, and from that commanding eminence, watch the wide sweep of sea visible to the north and east. Called attention to the sudden show of mare's trails high in the sky in the northwest. The wind was then blowing from the southwest in a mild degree, which in barometrical language is ranked number two light breeze. The Coast Guard on duty at once made report, and one old fisherman, who for more than half a century has kept watch on weather signs from the East Cliff, foretold of an emphatic manner of coming of a sudden storm. The approach of sunset was so very beautiful, so grand in its masses of splendidly colored clouds, that there was quite an assemblage on the walk along the cliff to the old court churchyard to enjoy the beauty. Before the sun dipped below the ma black mass of Kettleness, standing boldly earthward in the western sky, its downward way was marked by a myriad of clouds of every sunset color. Flame, purple, pink, green, and violet, and all the tints of gold were there, and their masses, not large, but seemingly absolute blackness, and all sorts of shapes, as well outlined as colossal silhouettes. The experience was not lost on the painters, and doubtless some of the sketches of the prelude of the great storm, will grace the R.A. and R.I. walls in the next May. More than one captain made up his mind then and there that this, that his cobble or his mule, as they term the different classes of boats, would remain in the harbor till the storm had passed. The wind fell away entirely during the evening, and at midnight there was a dead calm, a sultry heat, and the prevailing intensity which on the approach of thunder affects persons of a sensitive nature. There were but few lights in the sea, at sight of sea, and for even the coasting streamers, which usually hugged the shore so closely, kept well to seaward. A few fishing boats were in sight. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner with all sails set, which was seemingly going westwards. The foolhardiness or ignorance of her officers was a prolific theme for comment while she remained in sight, and efforts were made to signal her to reduce sail in face of her danger. Before the night shut down, she was seen with sails idly flapping as she gently rolled on the undulating swell of the sea. As idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Shortly before ten o'clock, the stillness of the air grew quite oppressive, and the silence was so marked that the bleating of sheep inland or the barking of a dog in town was distinctly heard. And the band on the pier, with its lively French air, was like a discord in the great harmony of nature's silence. A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea. A high overhead, the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke. With a rapidity which, at the time, seemed incredible, and even afterwards is impossible to realize the whole aspect of nature at once became convulsed. The waves rose in growing fury, each overtopping its fellow, till, in a very few minutes, the great 
The lately glassy sea was like a roaring and devouring monster. White crested waves beat madly on the level sands and rushed up the shoveling cliffs. Others broke over the piers, and with their spume swept lant lanthorns and the lighthouses which rise from the end of the pier of Whitby Harbor. The wind roared like thunder and blew with such force that it was with difficulty that even strong men kept their feet or clung with grim grasp to iron stanchions. It was found necessary to clear entire piers of the mass of onlookers, or else the fatalities of the night would have been increased many-fold. To add to the difficulties and dangers of the time, masses of sea fog came drifting inland, wet, white clouds which swept, in, swept by in ghostly fashion so dank and damp and cold that it needed but little effort of imagination to think that the spirits of the loads lost at sea were touching their living brethren with the clammy hands of death. And many a one shuddered as the wreaths of sea mist swept by. At times the mist cleared, and the sea for some distance could be seen in the glare of the lightning, which now came thick and fast followed by each sudden peals of thunder, that the whole sky overhead seemed trembling under the shock of the footsteps of the storm. Some, scene, some of the scenes thus revealed were a measurable grandeur and of absorbing interest. The sea, running mountains high, threw skywards with each wave mighty masses of white foam, which the tempest seemed to snatch at and whirl away into space. Here and there a fishing boat, with a rag of sail running madly for shelter before the blast, now and again the white wings of storm-tossed seabird. On the summit of the east cliff, the new searchlight was ready for experiment, but had not yet been tried. The officers in charge of it got into the working order, and in pauses of the intrusing mist swept it with the surface of the sea. Once or twice its service was most effective, as when a fishing boat, with gunwale underwater, rushed into the harbor, able, by the guidance of the sheltering light, to avoid the danger of dashing against the piers. Each boat achieved the safety of the port, there was a shout of joy from the mass of people on shore. A shout which for a moment seemed to cleave the gale and was swept away in its rush. Before long, the searchlight discovered some distance away a schooner with all sails set, apparently the same vessel which had been noticed earlier in the evening. The wind had by this time backed to the east, and there was a shudder amongst the watchers on the cliff as they realized the terrible danger in which she was now. Between her and the port lay a great flat reef, on which so many good ships have from time to time suffered, and, with the wind blowing from its present quarter, it would be quite impossible for the, that she should fetch entrance to the harbor. It was now nearly the hour of high tide, but the waves were so great that in their troughs the shallows of the shore were almost invisible, and the schooner, with all sails set, was rushing with such speed that, in the words of one old salt, she must fetch up somewhere, if it is only in the hell. Then came another rush of sea fog, greater than any hitherto masts, masts of dank mist, which seemed to close on all things like a gray pall, and left available to men only the organ of hearing. For the roar of the tempest and the crash of the thunder, the booming of the mighty billows came through the damp oblivion even louder than before. The rays of the searchlight were kept fixed on the harbor mouth across from the east pier, where the shock was expected, and men waited breathless. The wind suddenly shifted to the northeast, and the remnant of the sea fog melted in the blast. And then, Mirabodictu, between the piers, leaping from wave to wave as it rushed at headlong speed, swept the strange schooner before the blast, with all sail set, and gained the safety of the harbor. The searchlight followed her, and a shudder ran through all who saw her. For lashed to the helm was a corpse with a drooping head which swung horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. No other form could be seen on deck at all. 
A great awe came to all that, as they realized that the ship, as if by a miracle, had found the harbor, unsteered save by the hand of a dead man. However, all took place more quickly than it takes to write these words. The schooner paused not, but rushing across the harbor, pitched herself on that accumulation of sand and gravel washed by many tides and many storms into the southeast corner of the pier jutting under the east cliff, known locally as Tate Hill Pier. There was, of course, a considerable concussion as the vessel drove up the sand heap. Every spar, rope, and stay was strained, and some of the top hammer came crashing down. But strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang up on deck from below, as if it shot up by the concussion, running towards, jumped on the bow and onto the sand, making straight for the steep cliff where the churchyard hangs over the laneway to the east pier so steeply that some of the flat tombstones, thrustings, and through stones, or as they call them at Whitby Vernacular, actually project over where the sustaining cliff has fallen away. It appeared in the darkness, which seemed intensified just beyond the focus of the searchlight. It so happened that there was no one at the moment to take help here, as all those whose houses were in close proximity were either in bed or were out in the heights above. Thus the Coast Guard on duty on the eastern side of the harbor, who once, at, who at once ran down to the little pier, was the first to climb on board. The men working the searchlight, after scouring the entrance of the harbor without seeing anything, then turned the light on the derelict and kept it there. The Coast Guard ran aft when he came beside the wheel, bent over to examine it, and recoiled at once as though under some sudden emotion. This seemed to pique the general curiosity, and quite a number of people began to run. It's a good way around the West Cliff by the drawbridge to Tate Hill Pier. But your correspondent is a fairly good runner, and came well ahead of the crowd. When I arrived, however, I found already assembled on the pier a crowd, whom the Coast Guard and police refused to allow to come on board. By the courtesy of the chief boatman, I was, as your correspondent, permitted to climb on deck, and was one of a small group who saw the dead seaman whilst actually lashed to the wheel. It was no wonder that the Coast Guard was surprised, or even awed, for not often can one see such a sight. The man was simply fastened by his hands, tied one over the other, to a spoke of the wheel between the inner hand and the wood was a crucifix, the set of beads on which it was fastened being around both wrists and wheel, and all kept fast by binding cords. The poor fellow may have been seated at one time, but the flapping and buffeting of the sails worked through the rudder of the wheel and dragged him to and fro, so that the cords with which he was tied had cut the flesh to the bone. Accurate note was made of the state of things, and Dr. Surgeon J. M. Caffin, of 33, East Elliot Place, who came immediately after me, declared, after making examination, that the man must have been dead for quite two days. In his pocket was a bottle, carefully corked, empty save for a little roll of paper, which proved to the addendum of the log. The Coast Guard said the man must have been tied up by his own hands, fastening the knots with his teeth. The fact that a Coast Guard was the first on board may save some complications. Later on, in the Admiralty Court, for the Coast Guards cannot claim the salvage, which is the right of the first civilian entering on a derelict. Already, however, the legal tongues were wagging, and one, one young law student was loudly asserting that the rights of the owner are already completely sacrificed, his property being held in contravention of the statutes of Mortmain, since the tiller, as emblemship, if not proof, of the delegated possession, is held in a dead hand. It is needless to say that the dead steerman has been reverently removed from the place where he held his honorable watch and ward till death, a steadfastness as noble as that of the young Casabianca, and placed in the mortuary to await inquest. Already the sudden storm is passing, and its fierceness is abating. 
The crowds are scattering homewards, and the sky is beginning to redden over Yorkshire worlds. I shall send, in time for your next issue, further details of the derelict ship which found her way so miraculously into harbor in the storm. Whitney 9th August The sequel to the strange arrival of the derelict in the storm last night is almost more startling than the thing itself. It turns out that the schooner is a Russian from Varna and is called Demeter. She is almost entirely in ballast of silver sand, with only a small amount of cargo. A number of great wooden boxes filled with mold. The cargo was consigned to a Whitby solicitor, Mr. S. M. Billington of Seven the Crescent, who this morning went aboard and formally took possession of the goods consigned to him. The Russian consul, too, acting for the charter party, took formal possession of the ship, and paid all harbor dues, etc. Nothing is talked about here today except the strange coincidence. The officials of the Board of Trade have been most exciting in seeing that every compliance has been made with the extinguishing existing regulations. As a matter of to the nine days wonder, they are evidently determined that there shall be no cause for of a complaint. A good deal of interest was aboard concerning the dog which landed when the ship struck and more than a few of the members of the SPCA, which is very strong in Whitby, have tried to befriend the animal. To the general disappointment, however, it was not to be found. It seems to have disappeared entirely from the town. It may be that it was frightened and made its way to the moors, where is more still hiding in terror. There are some who look with dread on such a possibility, lest later on it should return itself become a danger, and for it is evidently a fierce brute. Early this morning, a large dog, a half-bred mastiff belonging to a coal merchant close to the Tate Pier Hill, was found dead on the roadway opposite the master's yard. It had been fighting, and manifestly had had a savage opponent, for its throat was torn away, and its belly was split open as if with a savage claw. Later. By the kindness of the Board of Trade Inspector, I have been permitted to look over the logbook of the Demeter, which was in order up to within three days, but contained nothing of special interest except as to the facts of missing men. The greater interest, however, is with regard to the paper found in the bottle, which was today produced at the inquest, and a more strange narrative than the two between them unfold it has not been my lot to come across. As there is no motive for concealment, I am permitted to use them, and accordingly send you a rescript, simply omitting technical details of seamanship and supercargo. It almost seems as though the captain had been seized with some kind of mania before he got well into blue water, and that this had developed persistently throughout the voyage. Of course, my statement must be taken con guano, since I am writing from the dictation of a clerk of the Russian consul, who kindly translated for me, time being short. The Log of the Demeter, Varnett Whitby Written 18 July Things so strange happening that I shall keep accurate note henceforth till we land. On 6 July, we finished taking in cargo, silver sand and boxes of earth, at noon set sail, east wind, fresh, crew, five hands, two mates, cook, and myself, captain. On 11 July, at dawn, entered before us, boarded the Turkish customs officers. Bakshish, al underway at 4 p.m. On 12 July, through Darndalis, more customs officers and flagboat of guarding squadron. Bakshish again. Work of officers thorough, but quick. Want us off soon. At dark passed since Arpelagigo. Archipelago. Yeah, that one. On 13th July, past Cape Matapan. Crew dissatisfied about something. Seemed scared, but would not speak out. On July 14th, was somewhat anxious about crew, men all steady fellows who sailed with me before. Mate could not make out what was wrong. They only told him that there was something on board, 
and crossed themselves. Matelas temper with one of them that day and struck him. Experienced fierce quarrel, but all was quiet. On 16 July, Mate reported in the morning that one of the crew, Profusky, was missing. Could not account for it. Took larboard watch eight bells last night. Was relieved by Arbamoff, but did not go to Monk. Men more downcast than ever. All they expected, all said they expected something of the kind, but would not say more that there were something on board. Mate getting very impatient with them. Feared some trouble ahead. On 17 July, yesterday, one of the men, Ogarin, came to my cabin in an awestruck way, confided to me that he thought there was a strange man aboard the ship. He said that in his watch he had been from shouting behind the deckhouse, and there was in the rainstorm when he saw a tall, thin man, who was not like any of the crew, come up from the, the companionway and go along the deck forward and disappear. He followed cautiously, but when he got to bows, found no one that found no one, and the hatchways were all closed. He was in a panic of superstitious fear, and I am afraid the panic may spread. To ally it, I shall today search entire ship carefully from stem to stern. Later in the day, I got together the whole crew and told them, as they evidently thought there was someone on the ship, we should search from stem to stem. First made angry, said it was a folly, and to yield to such foolish ideas would demoralize the men. He said it would engage to keep them out of trouble with a hand spike. I let him take helm, while the rest began the thorough search. All keeping abreast with lanterns, we left no corner and searched. As there was only big wooden boxes, there were no odd corners where a man could hide. Mince much relieved when the search over, and went back to work cheerfully. First mate scowled and said nothing. 22nd July. Rough weather last three days, and all hands busy at sails. No time to be frightened. Men seem to have forgotten their dread. Mate cheerful again, and all on good terms. Praise men for their work in bad weather. Past Gibraltar, and out through straits. All well. 24th July. There seems to be some doom over the ship, already a hand short and entering the Bay of Biscay with wild weather ahead, and yet last night another lo man lost, disappeared. Like the first, he came off his watch and was not seen again. Men all in panic of fear. Sent around Robin, asking to have double watch, as they fear to be alone. Mate violent. Fear there will be some trouble as either he or the men will do some violence. 28th July. Four days in hell, knocking about in some sort of maelstrom, and the wind is a tempest. No sleep for anyone, men all worn out. Hardly know how to set a watch since no one fit to go on. The second may volunteer to stay here and watch, and let men snatch a few hours sleep. Wind abating. Seas all terrific. I feel less. The st ship is steadier. 29 July. Another tragedy. I had single watch tonight, and its crew too tired to double. When morning watch came to deck, they could find no one except steermen. Raised outcry, and all came on deck. Throw a search, but found no one. Are now without second mate, and crew in panic. Mate and I agreed to go armed henceforth, and wait for any sign of cause. 30th July. Last night, rejoiced we were nearing England, weather fine, all sails set. Retired, worn out, slept soundly, awakened by mate, telling me that both men on the watch and steermen missing. Only self and mates and two hands left to work ship. That's a lot of seamen. 1st August, two days of fog, and not a sail sighted. I had hoped when the English Channel to be able to signal for help to get somewhere. Not having power to work sails, have to run before wind. Dare not lower, could not raise them again. We keep, we seem to be drifting to some terrible doom. Mate now more demoralized than either of them. His stronger nature seems to have worked inwards against himself. Men are beyond fear, working stolidly and patiently, with minds made up to worst. They're Russian, he Romanian. 2. August, Midnight 
I woke up from a few minutes sleep by hearing a cry, seemingly outside my ports. I could see nothing in fog. I rushed to deck and ran against mate. He tells me he heard cry and ran, but no sign of man on watch. One more gone. Lord help us. Mate says we must be past Straits of Dover, and in the moment the fog lifting, he saw the North Foreland just as he heard man cry out. If so, we are now off in the North Sea, and only God can guide us in this fog, which seems to move with us, and God seems to have deserted us. 3rd August At midnight, I went to relieve the man at the wheel, but when I got there, I found no one was there. The wind was steady, and as we ran before, it was there no yawing. I dared not leave it, so shouted for mate. After a few seconds, he rushed up on deck in his flannels. He looked wild-eyed and haggard, and I greatly fear his reason had given way. He came close to me and whispered hoarsely, with his mouth to my ear, as though fearing the very night air might hear. It is here. I know it now. On the watch last night, I saw it. A man, tall and thin, and ghastly pale. It was in the bows and looking out. I crept behind it, gave it my knife, but the knife went through it, empty as the air. And as he spoke, he took the knife and drove it strangely into space. Then he went on. But it is he here, and I'll find it. It is in the hold, perhaps. One of these boxes. I'll unscrew them one by one and see. You work the helm. And with a warning look and his finger on his lips, he went below. There was a springing up and choppy wind, and I could not leave the helm. I saw him come out on the deck again with a tool chest and a lantern, and go down in the forward hatchway. He is mad, stark raving mad, and it's no use of my trying to stop him. He can't hurt those big boxes, their invoice is clay. And to pull them up about his madness is a thing as he can do. So here I stay, and mind the helm, and write these notes. I can only trust in God and wait until the fog clears. Then, if I can't steer to any harbor with the wind that is, I shall cut down sails and lie by and signal for help. It is nearly all over now, just as I was beginning to hope that the mate would come out calmer, for I heard him knocking away at something in the hold. And work is good for him. Then came up a hatchway a sudden startled scream, which made my blood run cold. And up on the deck he came as if shot by from a gun, a raging madman, with his eyes rolling and his face convulsed in fear. Save me, save me, he cried. Then he looked around in the blanket of fog. His horror turned to despair, and in a steady voice he said, You had better come too, Captain, before it is too late. He is there. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him, and it is all that is left. Before I could say a word or move forward to seize him, he sprang forward on the bulwark and deliberately threw himself into the sea. I suppose I know the secret now, too. It was this madman who got rid of all the men one by one, and now he's followed them himself. God help me. How am I to account for all these horrors when I get to port? When I get to port, well, will that ever be? 4th August. Still fog. Which the sunrise cannot pierce. I know there is a sunrise because I am a sailor, and why else I know not. I dared not go below, I dared not leave the helm, so here I stayed all night. And in the dimness of the night I saw it. Him. God forgive me. But the mate was right to jump overboard. It is better to die like a man, to die like a sailor in the blue water, than no man can object. But I am captain, I must not leave my ship. But I shall baffle this fiend or monster, for I shall tie my hands to the wheels with my strength begins to fail. Along with him I shall tie that which he it dare not touch. And then, come good wind or foul, I shall save my soul and my honor as a captain. I am growing weaker, and the night is coming. If he can look me in the face again, I may not have time to act. If we are wrecked... Mayhaps this bottle will be found, and those who find it will may understand. If not, well, then all men shall know that I have been true to my trust. God and the Blessed Virgin and the saints help a poor ignorant soul trying to do his duty. 
Of course, the verdict was an open one. There is no evidence to adduce, and whether or not the man himself committed the murders, there is no known to say. The folk hold almost universally here that the captain is simply a hero, and that he is given a public funeral. Already it is arranged that his body is to be taken with the train of boats up the Esk for peace, then brought back to Tate Hill Pier and up the Abbey Steps, where he is buried in the churchyard of the cliff. The owners of more than a hundred boats have already given their names in wishing to follow him to the grave. No trace was ever found of the great dog, at which there is mourning, for, with public opinion at its present state, I would, I believe, be adopted by the town. Tomorrow we'll see the funeral, so we'll end this one more mystery of the sea. Minimer is journey. Journal. Yeah. 8th August. Lucy was very restless all night, and I, too, could not sleep. The storm was fearful, and as it boomed loudly among the chimney pots, it made me shudder. When a sharp puff came in, it seemed like a distant gun. Strangely enough, Lucy did not wake, but she got up twice and dressed herself. Fortunately, each time I awoke in time and managed to undress her without waking her and got her back to bed. It is a very strange thing, the sleepwalking, for as soon as her will is thwarted in any physical way, her intention, if there, is, if there be any, disappears, and she yields herself almost exactly to the routine of her life. Early in the morning we both got up and went down to the harbor to see if anything had happened in the night. There were, a few, there, was, there were very few people about, and though the sun was bright and the air was clear and fresh, the big, grim-looking waves seemed to dark themselves because the foam that topped them was like snow, forced themselves in through the narrow mouth of the harbor, like a bullying man going through a crowd. Somehow I felt glad that Jonathan was not on sea last night, but on land. But, oh, is he on land or sea? Where is he now, and how? I'm getting fearfully anxious about him, if only I knew what to do, and could do anything. 10th August. The funeral of the poor sea captain today was most touching. Every boat in the harbor seemed to be there, and the coffin was carried by captains all the way from Tate Hill Pier up to the, chur up to the churchyard. Lucy came with me, and we went clearly to our old seats, whilst the courtyards of boats went up the river to the viaduct and, some, and came down again. We had a lovely view and saw the procession clearly, well, nearly all the way. The poor fellow was laid to rest quite near our seat, so that we stood on it when the time came and saw everything. Poor Lucy seemed much upset. She was restless and uneasy all the time, and I cannot but think that her dreaming at night is telling on her. She is quite odd in one thing. She would not admit to me that there is any cause for restlessness. Or if there were, she does not understand it herself. There's additional cause in that poor old Mr. Swales was found dead in his morning of our seats, his neck being broken. He had evidently, as the doctor said, fallen back in the seat in some sort of fright, for there was a look of fear and horror in the man, in the face of the man, said made them shudder. Poor dear old man. Perhaps he had seen death with his dying eyes. Lucy is so sweet and sensitive that she feels influences more acutely than other people do. Just now she is quite upset by the little thing, which I did not need, heed, though I myself am very fond of animals. One of the men who came up here very often to look at the boats was followed by his dog. His dog was always with him. They are both quiet persons, and I never saw the man angry nor heard the dog bark. During the service, the dog would not come to its master, who was on the seat near with us, but it kept a few yards off, barking and howling. Its master spoke to it gently, and then harshly, and angrily, but neither, but it would neither come nor cease to make noise. It was a sort of a fury with its savage eyes and all its hairs bristling out like a cat's tail when the puss is on the warpath. Finally, the man, too, got angry and jumped down and kicked the dog. And then it took it by the scruff of the neck and half dragged and half threw it down the tombstone on which the seat was fixed. 
The moment it touched the stone, the poor thing became quiet and fell all into terrible trouble. It did not try to get away, but crouched down, quivering and cowering, and was in such a pitiable state of terror that it tried, though without effect, to comfort it. Lucy was full of pity, too, but she did not attempt to touch the dog, but looked at it with an agonized sort of way. I greatly fear that she is too supersensitive a nature to go through the world without trouble. She will be dreaming of this tonight, I'm sure. The whole aggl agglomeration of things. The ship steered into port by a dead man, his attitude. Tied to the wheel with a crucifix and beads. The touching funeral. The dog, now furious with... Now furious and now in terror. Were all forward material for her dreams. I think it would be best for her to go to bed tired out physically. So I shall take her on a long walk by the cliffs to Robin Hood's Bay, and back. She ought not to have much inclination for sleepwalking, then. Chapter 8. Mina Murray's Journal. Same day, 11 o'clock p.m. Oh, but I am tired. If it were not that I have made my diary a duty, I should not open it tonight. We had a lovely walk. Lucy, after a while, was in gay spirits. Oh, and I think to just some dear cows who came nosing towards us in the field in the lighthouse in front of the woods ahead of us. I believe we forgot everything, except, of course, personal fear, and it seemed to wipe the slate clean and give us a fresh start. We had a capital severe tea at Robin Hood's Bay in a sweet little old-fashioned inn, with a bow window right above, over the seaweed-covered rocks on the stand. I believe we should have shocked the new woman with our appetites. Men are more tolerant, bless them. Then we walked home with some, or rather, stoppages to rest, with our hearts full of constant dread of wild bulls. Lucy was really tired and went intended to creep off to bed as soon as we could. The young curate came in, however, and Mrs. Westerner and I asked him to stay for a supper. Lucy and I both had a fight to for it with a dusty miller. I know it was a hard fight on my part, and I am quite heroic. I think that some day the bishops must get together and see about breeding up a new class of curates who don't take supper, no matter how they may be pressed to, and who will know when girls are tired. Lucy is asleep and breathing softly. She has more color in her cheeks than usual, and looks oh so sweet. If Mr. Holmwood fell in love with her seeing her sleeping would only be in the drawing room. I wonder what he would say if he saw her now. Some of the new woman writers will some sort will some day start an idea that men and women should be allowed to see each other sleep before proposing and accepting. She will do the proposing herself. And a nice job she will make of it too. There's some consolation in that I'm happy tonight, because dear Lucy seems better. I really believe she has turned the corner, and that we are over the troubles of dreaming. I should be quite happy, if only I knew Jonathan. God bless and keep him. 11 August, 3 a.m. Diary again. No sleep now, so I might as well write. I'm too agitated to sleep. We have had such an adventure, such an agonizing experience. I fell asleep as soon as I closed my diary. Suddenly I became broad awake and sat up, with a horrible sense of fear upon me, and of some feeling of emptiness around me. The room was dark. I could not see Lucy's bed. I stole across and felt for her. The bed was empty. I looked a match and found that she was not in the room. The door was shut, but not locked, as I had left it. I feared to wake her mother, who had been more than unusually ill lately, so I threw on some clothes and got ready to look for her. As I was leaving the room, it struck me that the clothes she wore might give me some clue of her dreaming intention. A dressing gown would mean a house. Dress outside. Dressing gown and dress were both in their places. Thank God, I said to myself. She cannot be afar. She is only in her night dress. I ran downstairs and looked in the sitting room. Not there. Then I looked in all the other rooms of the house, with an ever-growing fear chilling my heart. 
Finally, I came to the hall door and found it open. It was not wide open, but the latch of the lock had not caught. People of the house are careful to lock the door every night, so I feared that Lucy must have gone out as she was. There was no time to think of what might happen. Vague, overmastering fear obscured my details. I took a big, heavy shawl and ran out. The clock was striking one as I was in the crescent, and there was not a soul in sight. I ran along the north terrace, but could see no sign of the white figure which I expected. At the edge of West Cliff, above the pier, I looked across the harbor to the East Cliff. And fear and hope, I don't know which, was seeing Lucy in her favorite seat. There was a bright moon, with heavy black driving clouds, which threw my whole scene into a fleeting diorama. Of light and shade they sailed across. For a moment or two I could see nothing, as the shadow of the cloud obscured St. Mary's Church and all around it. Then as the cloud passed I could see the ruins of the abbey coming into view, and the edge of the narrow band of light, the sharp, the sword cut, moved along. The church in the courtyard became gradually visible. Whatever my expectation was, it was not disappointed, for there, on our favorite seat, the silver light of the moon struck a half-reclining figure, snowy white. The coming of the cloud was too quick for me to see much, for shadows shut down almost the light immediately, for it seemed to me there was something dark stood behind the seat where the white figure shone, bent over it. What it was, whether man or beast, I could not tell. I did not wait to catch another glance, but flew down the steps to the pier and along the fish market to the bridge, which was the only way to reach the east cliff. The town seemed as dead, for not a soul I did see. I rejoiced that it was so, for I wanted no witness to poor Lucy's condition. The time and distance seemed endless, and my knees trembled as, and my breath became labored as I toiled up the endless steps to the abbey. I must have gone fast, and yet it seemed to me as if my feet were weighed with lead, as though every joint in my body was rusty. When I got almost to the top, I could see the seat and the white figure, for I was now close enough to distinguish it, even through the spells of shadow. There was undoubtedly something, long and black, bending over the half-reclining white figure. In fright I cried, Lucy, Lucy! And something raised a head and from where I could see the white face and red, gleaming eyes. Lucy did not answer, and I ran on to the entrance of the churchyard. As I entered, the church was between me and the seats, and for a moment or so I lost sight of her. When I came in view again, the cloud had passed, and the moonlight struck so brilliantly that I could see Lucy, half reclining with her head lying over the back of the seat. She was quite alone, and there was not a sign of any living thing about her. When I bent over her, I could see that she was still asleep. Her lips were parted, and she was breathing, not softly as usual with her, but in long, heavy gasps, as though striving to get her lungs full with every breath. As I came close, she put her hand in her sleep and pulled the collar of her nightdress close around her throat. While she did so, there came a little shudder through her, as though she felt the cold. I flung the warm shawl over her and drew the edges tight around her neck, for I dreaded lest she should come get some deadly chill from the night air. Unclad as she was, I feared to wake her all at once, so in order to have my hands free that I might help her, I fastened the shawl at her throat with a big safety pin. But I must have been clumsy in my anxiety and pinched or pricked it with her, for by and by, when her breathing became quieter, she put her hand to her throat again and moaned. When I had her carefully wrapped up, I put my shoes on her feet, and then began to gently try to wake her. At first she did not respond, but gradually she became more and more uneasy in her sleep, moaning and sighing occasionally. At last, as time was passing fast, and for many other reasons, I wished to get her home at once. I shook her more forcibly until she finally opened her eyes and awoke. She did not seem surprised to see me, as, of course, she did not realize all at once where she was. Lucy always wakes prettily, and even at such a time when her body must have been chilled with cold and her mind somewhat appalled at waking and clad in the churchyard at night, she did not lose her grace. 
She trembled a little and clung to me. When I told her to come at once with me home, she rose without a word, with the obedience of a child. As we passed along, the gravel hurt my feet, and Lucy noticed me wince. She stopped and wanted to insist upon me taking my shoes, but I would not. However, when we got to the pathway outside the churchyard, where there was a little puddle of water remaining from the storm, I daubed my feet with mud, using each foot in turn with the other, so that we went home with no one, in case we should meet someone, should notice my bare feet. <clears throat> fortune favored us, and we got home without meeting a soul. Once we saw a man, who seemed not quite sober, pass along the street in front of us, but we hid in a door till he had disappeared in an opening such as there were here. Steep little closes, or winds, as they call them in Scotland. My heart beat so loud that all the time that sometimes I thought I should faint. I was filled with anxiety, not Lucy, but about not for her health, at least she suffered for the exposure, but for her reputation in case the story should get wind. When we got in and had washed our feet and said a prayer of thankfulness together, I tucked her into bed. Before falling asleep, she asked, even implored, me not to say a word to anyone, even her mother, about her sleepwalking adventure. I hesitated at first to promise, but on thinking of the state of her mother's health, and how the knowledge of such things might would fret her, and thinking, too, of how such a story might become distorted, <laughs> uh, infallibly would, in case it should leak out, I thought it wiser to do so. I hope I did right. I have locked the door, and the key is tied to my wrist, so perhaps I shall not be again disturbed. Lucy is sleeping soundly, and the reflex of the dawn is high and far over the sea. Same day, noon. All goes well. Lucy slept till I woke her, and seems not to have even changed her side. The adventure of the night does not seem to have harmed her. On the contrary, it has befitted her. For she looks better this morning than she has done for weeks. I was sorry to notice that my clumsiness with the safety pin hurt her. Indeed, I might have been serious for the skin as her throat was pierced. I must have pinched up in the sleeve loose skin and transfixed it. For there are two little red points like pinpricks, and on the band of her nightdress was a drop of blood. When I apologized and was concerned about it, she laughed and petted me and said she did not even feel it. Fortunately, it is not enough to leave a scar, as it is so tiny. Same day, at night. We passed a happy day. The air was clear and the sun bright. There was a cool breeze. We took our lunch to the Mulgrave Woods, Mrs. Westerina driving by the wood, and Lucy and I walking by cliff path and joining her at the gate. I felt a little sad myself, for I could not but feel how absolutely happy I would have been had Jonathan been with me. But there, I must only be patient. In the evening we strolled past the casino terrace and heard some good music by the floor and Mackenzie, and went to bed early. Lucy seems more restful than she has been the last time, and fell asleep at once. I shall lock the door and secure the key as same as the night before, though I do not expect any trouble tonight. 12th August. My expectations were wrong. Twice during the night I was awakened by Lucy trying to get out. She seemed, even in her sleep, to be a little impatient at finding the door shut, and went back to bed under a sort of protest. I woke with the dawn and heard the birds chirping outside the window. Lucy woke too, and I was glad to see that she was even better than on the previous morning. All of her old gaiety seemed to have come back. She came and snuggled beside me, and told me about Arthur. I told her how anxious I was about Jonathan, and then she tried to comfort me. Well, she succeeded somewhat, for though sympathy can't alter facts, it can make them more bearable. 13th August Another quiet day, and to bed with a key on my wrist as before. Again I woke in the night and found Lucy sitting up in bed, still asleep, pointing at the window. I got up quietly, and pulling aside the blind, looked out. 
It was a brilliant moonlight, and the soft effect of the night over the sea and sky merged together in one great silent mystery. It was beautiful beyond words. Between me and the moonlight flitted a great bat, coming and doing great whirling circles. Once or twice it came close, but was, I suppose, frightened at seeing me, and flitted away across the harbor towards the abbey. When I came back to, from the window, Lucy had lain down and was sleeping peacefully. She did not stir again all night. 14th August On the east cliff, reading and writing all day, Lucy seems to have, got, have become much in love with the spot as I am. It is hard to get her away from it when it is time to come home for lunch, tea, or dinner. In the afternoon, she made a funny remark. We were coming home from dinner, and she had to stop on top of the steps from the west pier and stopped to look at the view, as we generally do. The sun was setting low down in the sky and was just dropping behind Candlemas. A red light was thrown over the east cliff and rumbled abbey, and seemed to bathe everything in a beautiful rosy glow. We went silent for a while, then suddenly murmured to herself, His red eyes again. They are just the same. It was an odd expression, coming a propos of nothing, that it seemed quite startling. I slewed about a bit, as to see Lucy well without seeming to stare at her, and saw that she was half dreamy state, with an odd look on her face that I could not quite make out. So I said nothing but followed her eyes. She appeared to be looking over our town seats, whereupon a dark figure was seated alone. I was a little startled myself, for it seemed for an instant as if the stranger had great eyes like burning flames. But a second left to spell the illusion. The red sunlight was shining on the windows of St. Mary's Church behind our seat, and as the sun dipped there, just as sufficient charge of refraction, and reflected to make it appear as the light had moved. I called Lucy's attention to the peculiar effect, and she became herself with a start. But she looked sad all the same. It may have been that she was thinking of that terrible night up there. We never referred to it, so I said nothing, and we went home to dinner. Lucy had a headache and went to bed early. I saw her asleep and went out for a little stroll myself. I walked along the cliffs to the westward, and was full of sweet sadness, for I was thinking of Jonathan. When coming home, it was then bright moonlight, so bright that, though the front of our part of the crescent was in shadow, everything could well be seen. I threw a glance up at our window, and saw Lucy's head leaning out. I thought that perhaps she was looking out for me. So I emptied my handkerchief and waved. She did not notice or make any movement whatsoever. Just then, the moonlight crept around an angle of the building, and the light fell on the window. There was distinctly was Lucy with her head lying up against the side of the window sill, and her eyes shut. She was fast asleep, and by her, seated on the window sill, was something that looked like a good-sized bird. I was afraid she might get a chill, so I ran upstairs. But as I came into the room, she was moving back to her bed, fast asleep, and breathing heavily. She was holding her hand to her throat, as though to protect it from the cold. I did not wake her, but tucked her up warmly. I have taken care that the door is locked and the window is secured, fast, fastly secured. She looks so sweet as she sleeps. She is paler than this her want, and there is a drawn, haggard look in her eyes, which I do not like. I fear she is fretting about something. I wish I could find out what it is. 15th August Rose later than usual. Lucy was languid and tired, and slept on after we had been cold. We had a happy surprise at breakfast. Arthur's father is better, and wants the marriage to come off soon. Lucy is quite full of joy, and her mother is glad and sorry at once. Later on in the day, she told me of the cause. She is grieved to lose Lucy at her very own, but she is rejoiced that she is soon to have someone to protect her. Poor dear sweet lady. She confided to me that she has got her death warrant. She has not told Lucy, but made me promise secrecy. Her doctor told her that within a few months, at most, she must die, for her heart is weakening. 
At any time, even now, a sudden shock would be almost sure to kill her. Ah, uh, we were wise to keep her, keep from her the affair of the dreadful night of Lucy's sleepwalking. 17th of August. No diary for two whole days. I have not had the heart to write. Some sort of shadowy pall seems to be coming over our happiness. No news from Jonathan, and Lucy seems to be growing weaker, whilst her mother's hours are numbering and close. I do not understand Lucy's fading away as she's doing. She eats well and sleeps well and enjoys the fresh air. But all the time she, the roses in her cheeks are fading, and she gets weaker and more languid day by day. At night I fear her gasping as if for, for air. I keep the key to our door fastened to my wrist. But she gets up and walks about the room and sits at the open window. Last night... I found her leaning out when I woke up. When I tried to wake her, I could not. She was in a faint. When I managed to restore her, she was as weak as water, and cried silently between long, painful struggles for breath. When I asked her how she had come to the window, she shook her head and turned away. I trust her feeling ill may not be from the unlucky prick of a safety pin. I looked at her throat now as she had laid asleep, and then all the tiny wounds seemed seem not to have healed. They are still open, and, if anything, larger than before, and the edges of them are faintly white, like they are little white dots with red centers. Unless they heal within a day or two, I shall insist on the doctor seeing about them. Letter. Samuel F. Billington and Son. Solicitors. Whitby to Messrs. Carter, Patterson, Co. London. 17th of August. Dear sirs, herewith please receive invoices of goods sent by Great Northern Railway. Same are to be delivered to Carfax near Perfect, immediately upon receipt of goods at King's Cross. The house is at present empty, but enclosed please find keys, all of which are labeled. You will please deposit the boxes, fifty in number, which form the consignment, in a particularly ruined building forming part of the house, and marked A on rough diagram enclosed. Your agent will easily recognize the locality, as it is the ancient chapel of the mansion. The goods leave by train at 9.30 tonight, and will be at King's Cross at 4.30 tomorrow morning. Afternoon. As our client wishes the delivery made as soon as possible, we shall be obliged to by your having teams ready to King's Cross at the time named and forthwith conveying the goods to the destination. In order to alleviate any delays possible through the routine requirements as to payment of your departments, we enclose a check here and within for ten pounds, receipts of which is please not acknowledge. Should the charge be less than this amount, you can return balance. If greater, you shall at once send a check for difference on the hearing from you. You are to leave the keys on coming away from the main hall from the house, where the proprietor may get them on his entering the house by means of his duplicate key. Pray do not take us as exceeding the bounds of business courtesy in pressing you in all ways to use the utmost expedition. We are your dear sirs, faithfully yours, Samuel F. Billington and Son. Letter, Messrs. Carter, Patterson & Co., London, to Messrs. Billington & Son, Whitby. Dear says, we beg to acknowledge $10 received and return the check of one pound, 17 cents, and D. I don't know, English curry, sorry. Amounts of overplus as shown in the receipts of the amount herewith. Goods are delivered in exact accordance with instructions, and keys left in the parcel in main hall as directed. We are, dear sirs, yours respectfully. Pro Carter, Patterson, and Co. Mina Murray's Journal 18th August I am happy today, right sitting here on the seat of the courtyard. Lucy is ever so much better. Last night she slept all night and did not disturb me once. The roses seemed coming back already to her cheeks, though she is still sadly pale and wan-looking. If she were in any way anemic, I could understand it, but she's not. 
She is in gay spirits and full of life and cheerfulness. All the morbid residence seems to have passed from her, and she has just reminded me, as if I needed any reminding, of that night, and that it was here, on this very seat, that I found her asleep. As she told me, she play tapped playfully on the heel of her boot with a stone slab and said, My poor little feet didn't make such a noise then. I dare say poor old Mrs. Swales would have told me that it was because I didn't want to wake up Geordie. Georgie. As she was in such a communicative humor, I asked her if she had dreamed at all that night. Before she answered, that sweet, puckered look came to her forehead, which Arthur, I call him Arthur from her habit, says he loves, and indeed I don't wonder that he does. When she went on in a half-dreaming kind of way, as if trying to recall to herself. I didn't quite dream, but it seemed all too real. I only wanted to be here in this spot. I don't know why, for I was afraid of something. I don't know what. I remember, though I suppose I was asleep, passing through the streets and over the bridge. A fish leaped as I went by, and I leaned over to look at it. I heard lots of dogs howling. The whole town seemed as if it must be full of dogs all howling at once. As I went up the steps, then I have a vague memory of something long and dark with red eyes, just as we saw in the sunset, and something very sweet and very bitter all around me at once. Then I seemed sinking into deep green water. There was a singing in my ears. But I have heard there is no drown there is drowning men. And then everything seeming passed away from me. My soul seemed to go out of my body and float about the air. I seemed to remember that once the West Lighthouse was right under me. And then there was a sort of agonizing feeling. As if I were in an earthquake. And I came back and found you shaking my body. I saw you do it before I felt you. Then she began to laugh. It seemed a little uncanny to me, and I listened to her breathlessly. I did not quite like it, and thought it better not to keep her mind on the subject. So we drifted on to other subjects, and Lucy was like her old self again. When we got home, the fresh breeze had braced her up, and her pale cheeks were really ro more rosy. Her mother rejoiced when she saw her, and we all spent a very happy evening together. 19th August Joy, 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 although not all joy. At last, news from my Jonathan. The dear fellow has been ill, and that is why he did not write. I am not afraid to think it, or to say it, now that I know that Mr. Hawkins sent me on the letter, and wrote himself, oh, so kindly. I am to leave in the morning and to go over to Jonathan and help him nurse, if necessary, and to bring him home. Mr. Hawkins says it would not be a bad thing if we were to be married out there. I have cried over good sister's letter till I can feel it wet beneath my bosom, where it lies. It is of Jonathan, and it must be next to my heart, for he is in my heart. My journey is all mapped out. My luggage is ready. I am only taking one change of dress. Lucy will bring my trunk to London and keep it till I send for it, for it may be that. I must write no more. I must keep it to say it's Jonathan, my husband. The letter that he sent and touched must comfort me until we meet. Letter, Sister Agatha, Hospital of St. Joseph and St. Mary, Budapest, to Miss Wilhelmina Murray. 12th of August. Dear Madam, I write my desire of Mr. Jonathan Harker, who is himself not strong enough to write. They are progressing well. Thanks to God and St. Mary and St. Mark. Joseph he has been under our care for nearly six weeks, suffering from a violent brain fever. He wishes me to convey his love and to say that by this post I write for him to Mr. Peter Hawkins, Exeter, to say, with his dutiful respects, that he is sorry for his delay, and that all his work is completed. He will require some more few weeks' rest in the sanatorium in the hills, but will return. He wishes me to say that he has not sufficient money with him, and that he would like to pay for his staying here, 
so that others who need shall not be wanting for help. Believe me, your sympathies and all blessings, Sister Agatha. P.S. My patient is being asleep. I open this to let you know something more. He has told me all about you and that you are shortly to be his wife. All blessings to both. He has had some fearful shock, so says the doctor, and in his delirium his ravings have been dreadful, of wolves and poison and blood, of ghosts and demons, and I fear to say what. Be careful with him always that there may be nothing to excite him of this kind for a long time to come. Traces of such an illness and his do not slightly die away. We should have written long ago, but we knew nothing of his friends, and there was on him nothing that anyone could understand. He came in the rain, he came in the train from Klosenberg, and the guard was told by the station master there that he rushed into the station shouting for a ticket for home. Seeing from his violent demeanor that he was English, they gave him a ticket for the farther station on the way thither that the train reached. Be assured that he is well cared for. He has won our hearts by his sweetness and gentleness. He is truly getting on well, and I have no doubt we will in a few weeks be himself. But be careful for him for safety's sake. There are, I pray, God and St. Joseph and St. Mary, many, many happy years for you both. <laughs> Dr. Seward's Diary 19th August Strange and sudden change in Renfield last night. About eight o'clock he began to get excited and to sniff about as a dog does when setting. The attendant was struck by his manner, and knowing my interest in him, encouraged him to talk. He is usually respectful to his attendant, and sometimes servile, but tonight, the man tells me, he was quite haughty. Would not consent to talk with him at all. All he wanted, would say was, I don't want to talk to you. Don't you count now. The master is at hand. The attendant thinks it is some sudden form of religious mania which has seized him. If so, we must now look for squalls, for a strong man with homicidal and religious mania at once might be dangerous. The combination is a dreadful one. At nine o'clock I visited him myself. His attitude to me was the same as it was to the attendant, and a sublime self-feeling of difference between myself and the attendant seemed to him nothing. It looks like religious mania and he will soon think that he is himself God. These infinitesimal distinctions between man and man are too paltry for an omnipotent being. How these madmen give themselves away. The real God taketh heed, lest the sparrow fall, but the God created from human vanity sees no difference between an eagle and a sparrow. Oh, if only men knew. For half an hour or more, Renfield kept exciting getting excited in greater and greater degree. I did not pret I did pretend not to be watching him, but I kept strict observation all the same. All at once that shifty look came into his eyes, which he always see when a madman has seized an idea, and with it the shifty movement of the head which and back which asylum attendants come to know so well. He became quiet, quite quiet, and went and sat on the edge of his bed and resignedly. I looked into space with lackluster eyes. I thought I would find out if his apathy were real or only assumed, and tried to lead him to talk of his pets, a scheme which had never failed to excite his attention. At first he made no reply, but at length said testily, Bother them all. I don't care a pin about them. What? I said. You don't mean to tell me that you don't care about your spiders. Spiders are at present his hobby, and the notebook is filling up with columns of small figures. To this, he answered enigmatically. The bride maidens rejoice, the eyes that wait to the coming of the bride. And when the bride draweth nigh, when the maidens shine, not the eyes that are filled. He would not explain himself, but remained obstinately seated in his bed at all the time I remained with him. I am weary tonight in the low spirits. I cannot think of Lucy and how different things might have been. 
If I don't sleep at once, Quirrell, the modern Morpheus, carbon 2, HCl3O, H2O, I love the fact they put the chemicals in here, I must be careful not to let it grow into a habit. No, I shall take none tonight. I have thought of Lucy, and I shall not dishonor her by mixing the two. If need be tonight, shall be sleepless. Glad I made the resolution, gladder that I kept it. I had lain tossing about when I heard the clock strike only twice when the night watchman came to me, sent up from the ward to say that Renfield had escaped. I threw on clothes and ran down to once. My patient is too dangerous a person to be roaming about. Those ideas of his might work out dangerous and with strangers. The attendant was waiting for me. He said he had not seen him ten minutes before, seemingly asleep in his bed when he looked through the observation trap door. His attention was called by the sound of the window being wretched out. He ran back and saw his feet disappear through the window, and had at once sent up for me. He was only in his night gear, and could not be far off. The attendant thought it would be more useful to watch where he should go than to follow him, as he might lose sight of him. While skidding out of the building by the door, he is a bulky man and couldn't get through the window. I am thin, and with his aid, I got out, feet foremost, and, as we were only a few feet above the ground, landed unhurt. The attendant told me to be patient. The patient had gone to the left and had taken the straight line, so I ran as quickly as I could. As I got through the belt of the trees and saw a white figure scale the high wall which separates our grounds from those of the deserted house, I ran back at once and told the watchman to get three or four men immediately to follow me to the grounds of Carfax, in case our friend might be dangerous. I got a ladder myself, and, crossing the wall, dropped down on the other side. I could see Renfield's figure just disappearing behind the angle of the house, so I ran after him. On the far side of the house, I found him pressed close against the old iron-bound side of the door of the oak chapel. He was talking, apparently to someone, but I was afraid to go near enough to hear what he was saying, lest I frighten him and he should run off. Chasing an errant swarm of bees is nothing to following a naked lunatic when he fit escaping is upon him. After a few minutes, however... I could see that he did not make take note of anything around him, so I ventured to draw nearer. The more so, my men had now crossed the wall and were closing on him. I heard him say, I am here to do your bidding, master. I am your slave, and you will reward me, for I shall be faithful. I have worshipped you long and far off. Now that you are near, I await your commands, and you will not pass me by, will you, my dear master? And your dis distribution of good things? He is a selfish old beggar, anyhow. He thinks of the loaves and fishes when he believes that he is real presence. His manias make a startling combination. When we close on him, he fought like a tiger. He is immensely strong, and he was more like a wild beast than a man. I never saw a lunatic in such a paroxysm of rage before. I hope I shall not again. It is a mercy that we found out his strength and this, his danger in good time. With strength and determination like this, he might have done wild work before he was caged. He is safe now, at any rate. Jack Shepard himself couldn't get free of the straight waistcoat that keeps him restrained, and he's chained to a wall in a padded room. His cries are at times awful, but the silences that follow are more deadly still for he means murder in every turn and movement. Just now he spoke coherent words for the first time. I am patient, master. It is coming, coming, coming. So I took the hint and came to. I too was excited to sleep, but this diary has quieted me, and I feel I shall get some sleep tonight. Chapter 9 Letter Mina Harker to Lucy Westerner Budapest, 24th August Ugh. 
My dear Lucy, I know you will be anxious to hear all that has happened since we parted at the railway station at Whitby. Well, my dear, I got to home, all right, caught a boat to Hamburg, and then the train on here. I can, I feel I can hardly recall anything of the journey except that I knew I was coming to Jonathan, and that, as I should have to do some nursing, I had better get all the sleep I could. I found my dear ones, oh, so thin and pale and weak-looking. All the resolution has gone out of his dear eyes, and that quiet dignity which I told you was in his face had vanished. He is only a wreck of himself, and he does not remember anything that has happened to him for a long time past. At least, he wants me to believe so, and I shall never ask. He has had some terrible shock, and I fear it might tax his poor brain if he were to try to recall it. Sister Agatha, who is a good creature and a born nurse, tells me that he raveled, raved of dreadful things while he was off his head. I wanted to, her to tell me what they were, but she would only cross herself and say she would never tell, that the ravings of the sick were the secrets of God, and that, that, and that if a nurse through her vocation should hear them, should respect her trust. She is a good sweet soul, and the next day, when she saw I was troubled, she opened up the subject again, and after saying that she could never mention what my poor dear raved about, added, I can tell you this much, my dear, that it was not anything about which he has done wrong himself, and you, as his wife to be, have no cause to be concerned. He has not forgotten you or what he owes to you. His fear was great and of terrible things, which no mortal can search of. I believe the dear soul thought I might be jealous, lest my being jealous about Jonathan. And yet, my dear, let me whisper. I felt a thrill of joy go through me when I knew that no other woman was the cause of the trouble. And now sitting by his bedside, where I can see his face while I sleeps. He is waking. When he woke, he asked me for his coat, as he wanted to get something from the pocket. I asked Sister Agatha, and she brought all his things. I saw that amongst them was his notebook, and was going to ask him to let me look at it, for I knew that I might find some clue of his trouble. But I suppose he must have seen my wish in my eyes, for he sent me away over to the window, saying he wanted quiet alone for a moment. Then he called me back, and when I came, he had his hand over his notebook, and he said to me very solemnly, Wilhelmina. I knew that when he was in dearest earnest, for he was never called me my, by the name since he asked me to marry him. You know, my dear, ideas of trust between a husband and wife. There should be no secret, no concealment. I have had a great shock, and when I try to think of what it is I feel... My head spin around. I do not know if it was real or the dreaming of a madman. You know I have had brain fever, and that is to be mad. The secret is here, and I do not want to know it. I want to take up my life here with our marriage. For my dear, we have decided to be married as soon as the formalities are complete. Are you willing, Wilhelmina, to share my ignorance? Here's the book. Take it and keep it. Read it if you will, but never let me know, unless, indeed, some solemn duty should come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep or awake, sane or mad, recorded here. He fell back, exhausted, and I took the pillow, book under his pillow and kissed him. I have asked Sister Agatha to beg Superior to let her wedding be in this afternoon, and I am waiting her reply. She has come and told me that the chaplain of the English Mission Church has been sent for, we are to be married in an hour, or soon after Jonathan wakes. Well, you see, this time has come and gone. I feel very sullen, but very, very happy. Jonathan woke with a little after the hour, but all was ready, and he sat up in bed, propped up by pillows. He answered his I will firmly and strongly. I could hardly speak. My heart is so full that even these words seem to choke me. The dear sisters were so kind. 
please God, I shall never, never forget them, nor the grave or sweet responsibilities that have taken upon me. I must tell you of my wedding present. When the chaplain and the sisters had left me alone with my husband, oh, Lucy, it is the first time I have written these words, my husband, left me alone with my husband, I took the book from under his pillow and wrapped it up in white paper and tied it with a little pale ribbon which was wound around my neck and sealed it over the knot with sealing wax. And for my seal I used my wedding ring. Then I kissed it and showed it to my husband and told him that I would keep it. And then it would be outward a visible sign for all of our lives that we trusted each other. That I would never open it unless it were for his own dear sake or for the sake of some stern duty. Then he took my hand in his, and oh, Lucy, that was the first time he took my his hand, his wife's hand, and then said it was the dearest thing in all the wide world, that he would go through all the pain again and past and when, if need be. Poor dear meant to have said a part of the past, but he cannot think of time yet. And I shall not wonder if first it mixes up not only the month but the year. Well, my dear, what should I what can I say? I can only tell him that I was the happiest woman in the wide world, and that I had nothing to give him except myself, my life, and my trust, and that with these went my love and duty for all the days of my life. And my dear, when he kissed me and drew me up to him with his poor weak hands, it was like a very solemn pledge between us. Lucy, dear, do you know why I tell you all this? It is not because it is all sweet to me, but because you have been and are very dear to me. It was my privilege to be your friend and guide you when you came from the schoolroom to prepare for, what, yeah, for the world of life. I want you to see now, and with the eyes of a very happy wife, where the duty has led me, so that in your own married life you too may be as happy as I am. My dear, please, almighty God, your life may be all it promises, a long day of sunshine, with no harsh wind, no forgetting duty, no distrust. I must not wish you no pain, for that can never be. But I do hope you will be always as happy as I am now. Goodbye, my dear. I shall post this at once and perhaps write you very soon again. I must stop, for Jonathan is waking. I must attend to my husband. Your ever-loving, Mina Parker. Letter, Lucy Westerna to Mina Parker. Whitby, 30th of August. My dearest Mina... Oceans of love and millions of kisses, and may you soon be your own home with your husband. I wish you could be coming home soon enough to stay with us here. The strong air would soon restore Jonathan, as has quite restored me. I have an appetite of a cormorant. I'm full of life and sleep well. You will be glad to know that I have quite given up walking in my sleep. I think I have not stirred out of my bed for a week. That is... When I once got up into the night, Arthur says I am getting fat. <laughs> By the way, I forgot to tell you that Arthur is here. We have such walks and drives and rides and rowing and tennis and fishing together, and I love him more than ever. He tells me that he loves me more, but I doubt that, for at first he told me that he couldn't love me more than he did then. But this is nonsense. There he is, calling to me. So no more must, so no more just at present from your loving. P.S. Mother sends her love. Seems better, poor dear. P.P.S. We are to be married on 28th September. Dr. Seward's diary. 20th August. The case of Renfield grows even more interesting. He is now so far quieted that there are spells of cessation from his passion. For the first week after his attack, he was perpetually violent. Then one night, just as the moon rose, he grew quiet and kept murmuring to himself, Now I can wait. Now I can wait. That didn't tame to tell me, so I ran down at once to have a look at him. He was still in the straight 
waistcoat and the padded room, but the suffused look had gone from his face, and his eyes had something of their old pleading. I might almost say cringing softness. I was satisfied with his present condition and directed him to be relieved. The attendants hesitated, but finally carried out my wishes without protest. It was a strange thing that the patient had humor enough to see their distrust. For coming close to me, he had in a whisper, all the while looking furtively at them, They think I can hurt you. Fancy me hurting you, the fools. It was something soothing, somehow, to the feelings to find myself dissociated, even the mind of this poor madman from the others. But all the same, I did not follow his thoughts. Am I to take it that I have anything in common with him, so that we are, as it were, to stand together? Or has he to gain from me some good so stupendous that my well-being is needful to him? I must find out later on. Tonight he will not speak. Even the offer of a kitten or even a full-grown cat will not tempt him. He will only say, I don't take any cat stalking cats. I have more to think of now. I can wait. I can wait. After a while I left him. The attendant tells me that he was quiet until just before dawn. And then he began to get uneasy, and at vi length violent, until at last he fell and so a paroxysm which exhausted him so that he swooned into a sort of coma. Three nights has the same thing happened. A violent old day, then quiet from moonrise to sunset. I wish I could get some clue to the cause. It would almost seem as if there was some influence which came and went. Happy thought. We shall tonight play sane wits against mad ones. He escaped before without our help. Tonight he shall escape with, with it. We shall give him a chance, and have the men ready to follow in case they are required. 23rd August The unexpected always happens. How well, this really new life. Our bird, when he found the cage open, would not fly. So all our subtle arrangements were for naught. At any rate, we have proved one thing, that the spell of quietness lasts a reasonable time. We shall in future be able to ease the bonds for a few day hours each day. I have given orders to the night attendant merely to shut him in the padded room, when once he is quiet, until the hour before sunrise. Poor soul's body will enjoy the relief if his mind cannot appreciate it. Hark, the unexpected again, I am called. The patient has once more escaped. Later. Another night adventure. Renfield artfully waited until the attendant was entering the room to inspect, then he dashed out past him and flew down the passage. I sent word for the attendants to follow. Again, he went to the grounds of the same deserted house, and they found him in the same place, pressed against the same old chapel door. When he saw me, he became furious, and had not the attendant seized him in time, he would have tried to kill me. As we were holding him, and a strange thing happened. He suddenly redoubled his efforts. And then as the suddenly groom calm. I looked round instinctively and could see nothing. Then I caught the patient's eye and followed it, but could trace nothing as if it looked like the moonlit sky, except a big bat which was flapping its wing flapping its silently and ghostly way to the west. Bats are usually wheel and flit around, but this one seemed to go straight down, as if it knew where it was bound for, or had some intention of its own. The patient grew calmer every instant, and presently said, You needn't tie me, I shall go quietly. Without trouble, we came back to the house. I feel there is something ominous in his calm, and I shall not forget this night. Lucy Westerner's Diary Hillingham, 24th August I must imitate Mina. Yeah. Keep writing things down. Then we shall have long talks as we do when we meet. I wonder what it will be. I wish you were here with me again, for I feel so unhappy. Last night I seemed to be dreaming again, just as I did at Whitby. Perhaps it is a change of air, or getting home again. It is it all dark? It is dark and horrid to me, for I cannot remember. No I can remember nothing, but I am full of vague fear. 
I feel so weak and worn out. When Arthur came to lunch, he looked quite grieved when he saw me, and I had the spirit to be cheerful. I wonder if I could sleep in Mother's room tonight. I shall make an excuse to try. 25th August Another bad night. Mother did not seem to take any proposal. She seems not too well herself, and doubtless she fears to worry me. I tried to keep awake and succeeded for a while, but then the clock struck twelve and waked me from a doze, so I must have been falling asleep. There was a sort of scratching or flapping at the window, but I did not mind it, as I remember no more. I suppose I must then have fallen asleep. More bad dreams. I wish I could remember them. This morning I am horribly weak. My face is ghostly pale, and my throat pains me. There must be something wrong with my lungs, for I didn't seem to get enough air. I shall try to cheer up when Arthur comes, or else I will know he will be miserable to see me so. Letter, Arthur Homewood to Dr. Seward. Albemarle Hotel, 13 August. My dear Jack, I want you to do me a favor. Lucy's ill, that is. She has no special disease, but she looks awful and is getting worse every day. I have asked her if there is any cause. I do not dare ask her mother, for to disturb the poor lady's mind about her daughter and her present state of health would be fatal. Mrs. Wesserna has confided to me that her doom is spoken, disease of the heart, though poor Lucy does not know yet. I am sure that there is something preying on that poor girl's mind. I am almost distracted when I think of her. To look at her gives me a pang. I told her I should ask you to see her, and though she demurred me at first, I know why, old fellow. She finally consented. It will be a painful task for you, I know, old friend, but it is for her sake, and I must not hesitate to ask or you to act. You are to come to lunch at Hillingham tomorrow at two o'clock. So try not to rouse any suspicion of Mrs. Rosina, and lunch after after lunch, Lucy will take an opportunity of being alone with you. I shall come in for tea, and we can go away together. I am filled with anxiety, and want to consult to lunch with you alone as soon as I can have to you. Do not fail. Arthur. Telegram, Arthur Homer to Steward. I am summoned to see my father, who is worse. I am writing. Write me fully by tonight's post to ring. Wire if necessary. Letter from Dr. Seward to Arthur Holmwood, 2nd of September. My dear old fellow, with regard to Miss Westerina's death, I hasten to let you know that at once that my opinion there is not a functional disturbance of any malady that I know of. At the same time, I am not by any means satisfied with her appearance. She is woefully different from what she was when I saw her last. Of course, you must bear in mind that I have not full opportunity of examination, such as I should wish. Our very friendship makes a little difficulty which not even medical science or custom can bridge over. I'd better tell you exactly what happened, leaving you with a draw, in a measure, with your own conclusions. I shall then say what I have done and propose doing. I found Miss Wersina in seemingly gay spirits. Her mother was present, and a few seconds I made up my mind that she was trying all she knew to mislead her mother and prevent her from being anxious. I have no doubt she guesses, if she does not know, what need of caution there is. We lunched alone, and as we all exerted ourselves to be cheerful, we got some kind of reward for our labors, some real cheerfulness among us. Then Mrs. Western and I went to lie down, and Lucy was left with me. We went into her boudoir, and until we got there, her gaiety remained, for the servants were coming and going. As soon as the door was closed, however, the mask fell from her face, and she sank down in a chair with a great sigh, and hid her eyes with her hand. When I saw that her high spirits had failed, I at once took advantage of her reaction to make a diagnosis. She said to me very sweetly, I cannot tell you how I loathe talking about myself. I reminded her that a doctor's confidence was sacred, but that you were grievously anxious about her. She caught on to my meaning at once and settled the matter in a word. Tell Arthur everything you choose. I do not care for myself, but all for him. So I am quite free. I can easily see that she is somewhat bloodless, 
but I could not see any usual anemic signs, and by chance I was able to test the quality of her blood. For an opening for an opening a window which was a stiff cord gave way, and she cut her hand slightly on broken glass. It was a slight matter of itself, but it gave me evident chance, and I secured a few drops of blood and have analyzed them. The quality of analysis gives me quite normal condition, and shows, I shouldn't fear, in itself a vigorous state of health. In other physical matters, I was quite satisfied that there is no need for anxiety, but as there must be a cause somewhere, I have come to the conclusion that it must be something mental. She complains of difficulty in breathing satisfactorily at times, and of heavy lethargic sleep, with dreams that frighten her, but regarding which she can neither remember nothing. She says that as a child she used to walk in her sleep, and that when Whitby the habit came back, and that once she walked out in the mites and went to East Cliff where Miss Murray found her. She assures me that of late the habit has not returned. I am in doubt, and so have done the best thing I know to do. I have written to my old friend and master, Professor Van Helsing of Amsterdam, who knows as much about obscure diseases as anyone in the world. I have asked him to come over, and as you told me that all things would be at your charge, I have mentioned to him who you are in your relations to Miss Westernham. This, my dear fellow, is the only obedience to your wishes, for I am too proud and happy to do anything I can for her. Van Helsing would, I know, do anything for me for a personal reason. So, no matter on the gro what ground he comes, we must accept his wishes. He is a seemingly arbitrary man, but this is because he knows what he is talking about better than anyone else. He is a philosopher and a metaphysician, and of the most advanced scientists of this day. And he has, I believe, an absolutely open mind. This, with an iron nerve, a temper of an ice brook, and an indomitable resolution, self-command and toleration exalted from virtues of blessings, and the kindness and truest heart that beats, these form his equipment for a noble work that he is doing for mankind, work both in theory and practice, for his views are wide and all-embracing sympathy. I tell you these facts so that you may know why I have such confidence in him. I have asked him to come at once. I shall see Miss Western tomorrow. She has to meet me at the stores, so that I will not alarm her mother by too early re repetition of my call. Yours always, John Stewart. Letter, Abraham von Helsing, M.D., Ph.D., D. Litt, etc., etc., to Dr. Stewart. 2nd of September. My good friend... When I have received your letter, I am already coming to you. By good fortune, I can leave at once, without the wrong to do any of those who have trusted me. Were fortune other than it were bad of those who have trusted, for I come to my friend when he call me to aid of those he holds dear. Tell your friend that when the time you suck from my wound so swiftly the poison of the gangrene, from the knife that our friend to nervous let sleep, you did more for him than when he wants my aids, and you call for them than all his great fortune could do. <laughs> Damn. But it is pleasure added to do for him, your friend. It is to you that I come. Have then the rooms for me in Great Eastern Hotel, so that I may be near at hand. I'm pleased to arrange that we may see the young lady, not too late tomorrow, for it is likely that I have to return here that night. But if need be, I shall come again in three days, and stay longer if I must. Till then, goodbye, my friend John. Van Helsing. Letter, Dr. Seward, to the Honorable Arthur Homewood. 3rd September. My dear Art, Van Helsing has come and gone. He came on to me with Hillingham and found that, by Lucy's discretion, her mother was lunching out so that we were alone with her. Van Helsing made a very careful examination of the patient. He is to report to me, and I shall advise you, for, of course, I was not present at the time. He is, I fear, much concerned, but says he must think. When I told him of our friendship and how you must trust me in the matter, he said, 
You must tell him all you think. Tell him what I think, if you can guess it, if you will. Nay, I am not jesting. This is no jest, but life and death, perhaps more. I asked what he meant by that, for he was very serious. This was when he had come back to town, and was having a cup of tea before starting on his return to Amsterdam. He would not give me further clue. You must not be angry with him, Art, because his very retinence means that all his brains are working for her good. He will speak plainly enough when, he, when the time comes, be sure. So I told him I would simply write the account of our visit, just as I was doing a descriptive article of the Daily Telegraph. He seemed not to notice, but remarked that the smuts in London were not quite so bad as they used to be when he was a student here. I am to get his report tomorrow, if he can possibly make it. In any case, I am to have a letter. Well, as to the visit, Lucy was more cheerful than on the day I first saw her, and certainly looked better. She had lost something of a ghastly look that so upset you, and breathe, her breathing was normal. She was very sweet to the professor, as she always is, and tried to make him feel at ease, although I could see that the poor girl was making a hard struggle for it. I believe Von Helsing saw it too, for I saw a quick look under his bushy brows that I knew of old. Then he began to chat of all things except ourselves and diseases, and with such infinite gen gen geniality that I could not I could see poor Lucy's pretent uh, pretense and animation merge into reality. Then, without seeming any seeming change, he brought the conversation gently around to his visit, and suavely said, "My dear young miss, I have the so great pleasure because you are much beloved." That is much, my dear, even were there that I do not see. They told me that you were in spirits, and that you were of ghastly pale. Then I said, Poof! Then he snapped his fingers at me and went on. But you and I shall show them how wrong they are. How can he? He pointed at me with the same look and gesture that he did once when he pointed me out in class, or rather after a particular occasion which he never fails to remind me of, know anything of young ladies. He has his madmans to play with and to bring them back to happiness, and to those that love them. <laughs> it is so much to do, and oh, but there are rewards that we can bestow with such happiness. But the young ladies, he has no wife nor daughter, and the young do not tell themselves to the young, but to the old, like me, who have known so much more sorrows and causes of them. So, my dear, we will send him away to smoke the cigarettes in the garden, while you and I have a little talk to ourselves. I took the hint and strolled about, and presently the professor came to the window and called me in. He looked grave, but said, I have made a careful examination, and there is no functional cause. But with you I agree that there has been much blood lost. It has been, but is not. But the condition of her are in no way anemic. I have asked her to send me her maid, that I may be asked one or two questions, that so I may not chance to miss something. I know well what she will say, and yet there is cause. There is always cause for everything. I must go back home and think. You must send me a telegram every day, and if there be cause, I shall come again. The disease, for not to be all oh, well as the disease, interests me, and the sweet young dear, she interests me too. She charmed me, and for her, if not for you or disease, I come. As I told you, he would not say a word more, even when we were alone. And so now, Art, you know all I know. I shall keep stern watch. I shall trust your poor father is rallying. It must be a terrible thing for you, my dear old fellow, to be placed in such a position between two people who are both dear to you. I know your idea of duty to your father, and you are right to stick with, to it. If need be, I shall send you word to come once to Lucy. Do not be so over-anxious unless you hear from me. Okay, I'm going to end after this chapter. Dr. Seward's Diary for September.
So Fadge's patient seems to st keep our interest in him. He had only one outburst, and that was yesterday at the unusual time. Just before the stroke of noon, he began to grow restless. The attendant knew from the symptoms, and at once summoned aid. Fortunately, the men came at a run, and were just in time, for at the stroke of noon he became so violent that it took all their strength to hold him. In about five minutes, however, he began to get more and more quiet, and finally sank into a sort of melancholy, in which state he has remained up to now. The attendant tells me that his screams, whilst in the parasim, were really appalling. I found my hands full when I got in, attending to some of the other pa patients who were frightened by him. Indeed, I can quite understand the effect, for the sounds disturbed even me, though I was some distance away. It is now after the dinner hour in the asylum, and as yet my patient sits in the corner brooding with a dull, sullen, woe-begone look in his face, which seems rather to indicate than show something directly. I cannot quite understand it. Later. Another change in my patient. At five o'clock I looked in on him and found him seemingly as happy and contented as he used to be. He was catching flies and eating them, and was keeping note of his capture and making nail marks on the edge of the door between the ridges of padding. When he saw me, he came over and apologized for his bad conduct and asked me to, in a very humble, cringing way to be led back to his own room and to have his notebook again. I thought it well to be his humor again. So back to his room he went and opened the window. He has the sugar of his tea spread on the windowsill and is reaping quite a harvest of flies. He is now eating, he's not now eating them, but putting them in a box as of old, and is already examining the corners of his room to find a spider. I tried to get him to talk about the past few days, for any clue of his thoughts would be immense help to me, but he would not rise. For a moment or two, he looked very sad, and said in a sort of faraway voice, as though saying it rather to himself than to me, All over, all over, he has deserted me. No hope for me now, unless I do it myself. Then suddenly, turning me in a resolute way, he said, Doctor, won't you be very good to me and let me have a little more sugar? I think it would be good for me. And the flies, I said. Yes, the flies like it too, and I like the flies, therefore I like it. And there are people who know so little as to think madmen do not argue. I procured him a double supply, and left him as happy a man as, I suppose, any in the world. I wish I could fathom his mind. Midnight, another change in him. I'd been to see Miss Worcesterina, whom I found much better, and had re just returned, and was standing on my own gate looking at the sunsets, when once more I heard him yelling. At his room on this side of the house I could hear better than in the morning. It was a shock to me to turn from the wonderful smoky beauty of the sunset over London, with its lurid lights and inky shadows, all the marvelous tints that come from the foul clouds even as in foul water, and to realize all the grim sternness of my own cold stone building, with its wealth of breathing misery, and my own desolate heart to endure it all. I reached him just as the sun was going down, and from his window saw a red disc sink. As it sank, he became less and less frenzied, and just as it dipped, he slid from the hands that held him an inert mass on the floor. It is wonderful, however, what intellectual recuperation power lunatics have. For within a few minutes, he stood up quite calmly and looked around him. I signaled to the attendants not to hold him, for I was anxious to see what he would do. He went straight over to the window and brushed out the crumbs of sugar. Then he took his fly box and emptied it outside, then threw away the box. Then he shut the window, and crossing over, sat down on his bed. All this surprised me, so I asked him, Are you not going to keep flies any more? No, he said. I'm sick of all that rubbish. It certainly is a wonderfully interesting study. I wish I could get some glimpse of his mind, or of all the cause of his sudden passion. Stop. There may be a clue after all. If we can find why today his paroxysms came at high noon and at sunset. 
Can it be that there is a malign influence of the sun, or periods which affects certain natures, as at times the moon does others? We shall see. Telegram, Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. September 4th. Patient so better today. Telegram, Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. 5th September. Patient greatly improved. Good appetite. Sleeps naturally. Good spirits. Color coming back. Telegram, Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. 6th September. Terrible change for the worse. Come at once. Do not lose an hour. I hold over telegram to Homewood. Till I have seen you.